Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Rung Week in Review. I'm Aspet Bedrosian, and together with Hovig Mancharian, this week we're going to talk about the following major topics. The Supreme Judicial Council appointments, Turkish-Azerbaijani military exercises in the Gars region, and the new U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken on Armenia. And to talk about these issues, we have with us Aram Hamparian, who is the Executive Director of the Armenian National Committee of America, the largest grassroots advocacy organization representing the views and values of Armenian Americans. Aspet Kochikian, who is Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the American University of Armenia, and Emil Sanamian, who is a Senior Research Fellow at USC's Institute of Armenian Studies, specializing in politics in the Caucasus, with a special focus on Azerbaijan. Hello and welcome, everyone. Hi, good to be with you all. Hello, Hovik, Aspet, Aram, and Hello. Emil. So to begin, this week, the National Assembly voted in two new members of the Supreme Judicial Council, Gagi Jahangirian and David Khachatrian. The parliamentary opposition boycotted the closed ballot vote, so this was purely a ruling bloc appointment. So the Supreme Judicial Council was formed in 2018 based on the 2015 constitutional referendum. It is tasked with matters related to courts and judges, such as carrying out disciplinary actions towards judges. Aspet, what do you think of these appointments? Who are Jahan Gideon and Khachatrian? The Supreme Judicial Council actually had two empty seats. Uh, it's a body of 10 people, uh, half of whom are appointed by the parliament, by the National Assembly, and the other five, the other half, is basically elected by the Federation of the Judges, or the General Meeting of Judges of Armenia. Uh, it had its ups and downs. It's interesting that uh, the beginning of this body started right before the Velvet Revolution, and it had a full body. They had Gagi Karujunian, who was actually elected the president of the council, uh, and then eventually he resigned. And uh, in the last year and a half or so, there have been new appointments, resignation, new appointments. So this time around, it seems that the National Assembly is fulfilling its duty of adding two new people into the uh, into this council, because the others are all from the Federation of Judges. So that is the background. I think in terms of the choices, they could be a bit controversial, to put it mildly. Yeah, in that's terms what of I was... both people, both candidates or both appointees. Yeah. With Jahangirian specifically, I think his background being more so as a military prosecutor rather than civilian related matters. I think it's a matter of a strong person. You know, he might come across as someone who has a strong credentials and hence the My Step faction is trying to put in someone who has a tough reputation. In terms of Khachatarian, in my limited information, he's the brother of Sasun Khachatarian, who's the head of the Special Investigation Services. So still separating the legal process from political one is a bit of an issue, as always in Armenia. Yeah. And there was also some criticism for Khachatarian of being employed by the U.S. Embassy in Armenia for almost eight years. So his sort of devotion to Armenia was under question. But Jahangirian really surprised me. And briefly from his biography, he was the chief military prosecutor from 1997 to 2006. He was a prosecutor during the October 27 investigation. That went nowhere so far. And there are a lot of allegations one way or the other of improprieties on how detainees were treated. He was a member of parliament for five Five years during Levon Petrosian's time. In fact, I would ask our listeners to listen to our previous podcasts uh, where we had Ruben Melikian or Aram Vartevanyan. They briefly touched upon John Gideon as well. Emil, what are your thoughts? And when we're talking about formers, I think we can't get any more former than John Gideon, can we? Oh, no, we can. There are some Soviet era officials still somewhere. But uh, bottom line is we have had this uh, wave of discontent against uh, Nikol Pashinyan. It's subsided for now. Uh, he's uh, reasserting control over the, the government apparatus, uh, reasserting control over the judiciary, which uh, he felt was slipping away from him, uh, starting with the ruling to release uh, Robert Kocherian on jail, and then uh, refusal to arrest Vazgen Manokian during the war, refusal by judiciary to approve detention of other political anti-Pashinyan uh, activists. Uh, so uh, the point of this is, of course, to make judiciary pliable uh, again, as it was in the first year or so of his government, and to arrest whoever Nicole believes should be arrested. That's kind of it. And uh, I'm not surprised at all that Jangirian is uh, brought in and other people whose loyalty is with Nicole and who has uh, long-standing animus with uh, Kocharian. So that's uh, it's all about uh, re-arresting Kocharian and whoever else might be a challenger. Going on what Emil said, I think it's interesting. Going back a year ago or so when there were extreme and fast-forward judicial reforms, quote-unquote, 
uh, put in place and suddenly things were forgotten. It's being thawed again uh, after the war and after a year. Uh, and probably, as Emily mentioned, this is preparation for things to come uh, in the next uh, six months or so. Yeah, I mean, the, the war or the external confrontation is something that Nicole cannot handle. So he will do as much as possible to avoid any external confrontation. But to reassert his authority, he will crack down hard domestically. I'm, I'm almost certain of it. I'm sure there's going to be trials of, for treason, blaming other people for you know, whatever reversals in the war, and whatever else they can be blamed for. I think that's the course of action that should be uh, anticipated. Even then, you would get further by getting people who are more impartial, or who seem, who seem to be more impartial. For instance, I was reading about the Madaris case, which eventually got acquitted, where several members of the armed services were convicted for murder and then acquitted. There were a lot of allegations of torture. I mean, this guy, just looking at his past record, seems to be very, very... The, the <laughs> ironic uh, ironic green. thing that they were acquitted by the father of David Khachatrian and Sasun Khachatrian, who was a judge at the time. Yeah. They were acquitted by in, in his ruling, and at the time he was considered more of an independent judge, uh, showed his independence versus the government of the time. I, I can't remember if it was already... I think it was already under Sir Saksian. So, yeah, you know, Jangirian is known, his modus operandi is to get testimony via torture. He's done that uh, whenever he had a chance to do, and he's well known for that. But that's not controversial as far as the Armenian government is concerned. It's a question of loyalty, uh, whether uh, he's ready to confront the enemies or enemies of uh, Nicole or not. That's, that's the main question. Yeah. I would move on, but I actually want to underscore one more thing. He has several properties, but he has this luxurious house in Yerevan. And I think when questioned about it in parliament, he said, uh, you know, compared with other houses, it was a barn. Incidentally, he's also renting this barn to the government of Iraq as the Iraqi embassy in Yerevan. So it's a pretty nice barn, I think, if you ask me. Yeah, again, it's not controversial that as a former official, he obviously uh, pocketed some money or used his influence to acquire some additional income and uh, property. Uh, this is commonplace. Again, the question boils down to whether a person is with Nicole or against Nicole. It's all about that. It, uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether he's corrupt or not. I mean, it's, it's secondary. In terms of mechanics, what are the next steps if Nicole truly wants to gain control of the courts? I believe the current president of the Supreme Judicial Council is Varta Zaryan. Do you foresee maybe some efforts to remove him as well so that they can have a tighter control of the Supreme Yeah, yeah, Judicial I'm pretty Council? sure that's going to be the next step as far as this particular uh, development, but even without uh, removal, I mean, uh, uh, the mechanics will be similar to constitutional court trying to split uh, the membership of the constitutional court, people who are uh, problematic to, I mean, people are very pliable, people are very pliable. Uh, with one caveat, Emil, is that the current president of the council is not appointed or is not elected by the parliament. Rather, he was elected by the conference of judges. Yes, yes. I mean, it's the same with the constitutional court, right? Yeah, but they will have more considerable, they have to utilize more considerable pressure and conniving to be able to get their candidates elected from the Federation yeah. of Judges. I was thinking they might open up some corruption investigations against the, the remaining judges that they're not fond of. Of course. The anti-corruption courts are being set up as well. So that's another front in this attack. The anti-corruption courts will be set up with uh, pretty much a direct input from the government from Nicole. So he will choose people who will be the judges. He will choose who basically who they go after, etc. It's sort of like editorial assignments. Okay, moving on. Uh, Turkish and Azerbaijani armed forces are going to be holding offensive military exercises in the Ghars region across Armenia's western border during the first half of February. These drills seem to be comprehensive and intend to exercise homegrown weaponry, it appears. The last time these two countries conducted exercises, the drills ended just the day before the Second Artsakh War. Emil, what do you make of these military games while there is still strong regional tension in the aftermath of the Second War? And what is the intended message? Well, the things are a little bit different from what you referred to as far as the exercises that happened over the summer. Over the summer, the exercises served as cover for Turkish deployment in Azerbaijan. Uh, in this case, the exercises are taking place inside Turkey, so they don't need the, the, this exercise for cover, for whatever. And this particular exercise is a regular exercise. They've had an exercise in cars for a number of years now. I think since 2012 they started having regular exercises. And normally these are uh, international exercises, so they would even have sometimes Europeans participate and... Uh, uh, some Asian countries friendly to uh, Turkey. In this particular case, I don't see this uh, as immediate threat to Armenia because uh, so far the line has been that they're not crossing the, the Republic of Armenia border. But, uh, you know, things can evolve. But it's uh, independent of this exercise. The Turkish position has evolved over the past couple of years from one of uh, sort of benign neglect of Armenia or uh, diplomatic pressure and uh, closure of the border. But, you know, generally just ignoring Armenia most of the time. But over the past couple of years, both through 
Aliyev's lobbying and through inability of Armenia and Armenian interest groups to normalize some kind of a relationship with Erdogan. It opened this opportunity for Turkey to confront Armenia directly, but again, via Azerbaijan, they haven't done it in a direct frontal assault towards Yerevan, which they hypothetically could do, but uh, uh, they decided to do it in, in, a, in a concealed way and they continue to do it. But this particular exercise is different from the last summer's reasons I mentioned. One thing I want to add on Emil's comments and uh, completely agreeing with most of his analysis, I think there's one caveat here again. And I think this was both Turkish and Azerbaijani military preparation to have summer and winter sort of exercises. And while the summer exercise, the July or August exercise, was used as a cover to also transfer a large amount of military equipment to Azerbaijan, it was long time in the making, both the July-August one uh, as well as the February 1 to 17, I think. Well, I think they announced the summer games very quickly after the July war. Yes, that's correct. And and as a matter of fact, if you look at the tempo of exercises between Turkey and Azerbaijan, they were growing between 2012, roughly, and 2019. In 2020, beginning of the 2020, because of the COVID pandemic, they actually canceled some of the exercises. They didn't have any direct uh, exercises in the spring, for example, which they normally do. And uh, the fighting in Tavuz became a trigger point for Turkey to go ahead with the uh, deployment of the Air Force in Azerbaijan and uh, using the exercises as an excuse. Initially, the deployment was supposed to be over by mid-August, but then something else changed and they decided to stay and launch the war. I mean, I mean, this is something that I was thinking about and I don't have any concrete information about this, but, you know, the focus uh, being in this exercise is that they're going to be using domestically produced weaponry and equipment. I don't know if this was something that was planned or they're basically re-evaluating looking at the performance of Turkish equipment during the Garapa war. You mean this Kars exercise? Yes. Yeah, basically this is new technology still for Turkey, right? Uh, the Bayraktar right. fleet. But they already uh, deployed it actively, but they've deployed it primarily initially in the counter-terrorist anti-PKK role. Uh, this is throughout 2018. Then they had the, this expeditionary forces in Syria, in Libya, and then now in uh, Azerbaijan also. Right. But incorporation of new technology in every particular unit takes time. And in this case, for example, this is a third army of Turkey on uh, the Erzurum base facing towards Armenia and Iran. Uh, they, you know, may have not had as much experience with it as the the other army that I think it's the second army that uh, was involved in Syria war. That kind of processes take place stage by stage. I mean, not everybody becomes learned about how to uh, coordinate, right. use new new things, uh, new, okay. new new tools that they get. Aram, what are your thoughts on this so far? The, the war games obviously a source for serious concern given the track record. Uh, so we're keeping a close eye on it. Now, Aram, in response to concerns raised about the exercises, Andrani Kocharyan, a member of the Armenian parliament, said that we shouldn't be too frightened about these exercises. Uh, incidentally, before the 44-day war, another member of parliament uh, from the same bloc, Lilith Malkun, said the same thing about the potential for Turkish military involvement. But what I want to ask is, what should be the appropriate messaging from the government to the citizenry on such threats? Uh, should the government downplay the importance or actually try to raise it uh, to keep the public alert about, you know, whatever may happen? Would you have any, uh, you know, if, if you were asked this question as a member of parliament, how would you respond? Well, thank God I'm not a member of parliament in Armenia, but it, these are always judgment calls. You want to be cautious and vigilant, but not, you know, becoming paranoid. And you want to uh, keep people, you know, you don't want to lead people into panic, but you don't want to be complacent. So it's a it's a balancing act and you want to be you know, thoughtful and sober and intelligent, devoted leaders who prioritize the security of their homeland would would let that guide their messaging. Uh, not, for example, trying, for example, to downplay things for domestic consumption for political purposes. That's that shouldn't be the guiding. The end result of the messaging isn't is this what increases my popularity? It should be what's the sober, serious message to share with my people about, you know, the, the, the extent of the challenges and threats to the homeland. Yeah, the, the, I think you put the question whether the public in Armenia should be in panic or not. And my answer is definitely they should be in panic uh, because Armenia no longer has a defense capacity of its own. And uh, if in the past, obviously, the from Turkey was something that Armenia could not match by itself, uh, it was in a hypothetical realm right now. It's in a real realm, in the, in the actual realm. It happened. So unless there is a substantial revision of uh, Armenian existence in, in Armenian homeland and uh, 
Russia is accepted as a sort of unquestionable sovereign and uh, or some other uh, entity, which doesn't come to mind right now. But uh, unless there is that kind of uh, revision in the Armenian security, it's it's a very vulnerable place. I don't think people should expect things just to go on as they used to go on. Uh, and precedent has been set. Turkish military killed in the neighborhood of, uh, I don't know how many thousand Armenian soldiers. And they haven't uh, received any kind of sanction for this. They have uh, only received rewards for this so far. Uh, so they f they feel the weakness there, and uh, it it will be uh, uh, and you know looking at it from Erdogan's political perspective, where he does have a number of uh, political challenges domestically, he looks at this case as a very successful one for him politically. So you know he might shed some more Armenian blood at some point for whatever reason and consider that another success. So Emil, very quickly in response to this, Armenia seems to have announced a small defensive exercise in a few villages in the south focused on improving the ability to evacuate the population and take shelter. Perhaps this is important when you have a, such a large threat, but isn't it also too important to show some teeth in response to the Azerbaijani Turkish display of force, potentially also involving uh, Russia or, you know, trying to bring in Russia's uh, role as, as, a, as a strategic partner here? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah, it would be nice to have teeth, yeah, to show them. But it used to be that Armenia and Russia actually held regular combined arms exercises, Bagramian military base, uh, proving ground there. But the last couple of years I haven't heard of them. There has been some smaller bilateral exercises and unilateral exercises by Russia in Armenia, but not ones between Armenia and Russia together as it used to happen years ago. Of course, it's a problem both from a political messaging perspective and also from perspective of coordinating potential joint action. At one point, a statement by, at the time, commander of the Russian military base I would say this was about five, six years ago, uh, 2016, uh, where he said that, you know, should Azerbaijan attack Karabakh, you know, we might have to get involved. Uh, and obviously this was a statement made not off the cuff, it was made through the official military newspaper of Russia. So the position of Ru position Russia was communicating at the time uh, was much more serious than it, what it's become since then. All right, moving on to the U.S. elections. Since Joe Biden was elected President of the United States, we've heard a lot of appropriate statements coming from his incoming administration. Biden's Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, responded to Congressman Menendez of New Jersey, affirming that he would seek to provide Armenia and Armenians around the South Caucasus appropriate security and humanitarian assistance, and more. Blinken also confirmed that Biden's administration would consult with Congress on the wording of its April 24th statement. To note, both houses of the U.S. Congress recognized the Armenian Genocide in near-unanimous votes at the end of 2019. So these are all good things to hear. Aram, can you summarize the Armenian community's expectations of the U.S. during the coming three to four years? And what are pragmatic, reasonable outcomes that the Biden administration can drive forward? You're certainly right that, that Blinken, in his response to Senator Menendez, the incoming chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, did prioritize the security of Armenia. He used the phrase, I think, protection of Artsakh. Uh, those may not be the exact words, but that was the, the point. He expressed a willingness to review Section 907, which imposes limits on U.S. military and other government-to-government -to -government aid to Azerbaijan, pledged to re-engage with the OSC Minsk Group, and as you mentioned, to consult with Congress on uh, this upcoming April 24th, their statement on uh, their annual Armenian Remembrance Day or Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. We'll, we'll, we'll find out on the morning of the 24th. Those are all, as you mentioned, encouraging signs. They represent considerable departure from the policy of the previous administration. We're hopeful that, that they'll act on the, on that rhetoric and that their cooperation and engagement on Armenian issues will extend to a broad range of other issues. I guess our expectations would fall into a number of different baskets. Um, of course, there's the assistance basket, which is in the form of humanitarian relief, housing, food security, healthcare, rehabilitation, demining, things of that nature, where our expectation is that they will support a robust emergency allocation, but that also will be followed up by appropriations that the administration would back. So it's a, there's really three, I guess, phases of the aid. One is emergency aid provided by the administration. Second is appropriated aid allocated by Congress. And the third, which is not really on the table just yet, is a new Millennium Challenge account if Armenia is eligible for that. And that's, that's a complex issue. But so there's the aid expectations. There's the rolling back or dialing back the support for Turkey and Azerbaijan uh, in the form of enforcing 907, cutting off the military program to Azerbaijan, which we understand has been at least suspended. There's certainly no aid going today, as far as we understand. 
And then also looking into the presence of U.S. drone parts um, that were used in the Barakar drones uh, that Azerbaijan deployed against uh, Artsakh and even Armenia. We're looking at, you know, more urgently uh, the, the release of prisoners, the U.S. engaging through the, the Red Cross and OSC and others to secure the release of Armenian captives. We're looking at the recognition of Artsakh as not necessarily a short-term goal, but a longer-term goal, uh, starting in Congress, working toward engagement with the executive on that. And then I would say, Osmed, in a fundamental reset of U.S.-Armenia relations that are aligned with the sovereignty of Armenia and the security of Armenia, the protection of Artsakh, that the focus should not be, the highest priority should not be on domestic issues, and, and, and which has historically involved the Armenian, uh, rather the U.S. Embassy, kind of playing favorites in Armenia and kind of like I think, almost mischief making in terms of Armenia's domestic politics and regional relationships. The assistance, the new relationship has got to be based on the security and sovereignty of Armenia. I think that's what, what we need to, that's one of our core expectations going forward. Aram, you mentioned the Millennium Challenge. What are the requirements for that? Well, there's really uh, two sets of requirements. One is good governance. And that means you have to be strong on democracy, strong on anti-corruption, things of that nature. And if you meet those criteria and you're a low-income country as defined by the World Bank, then you're eligible to enter negotiations toward a Millennium Challenge account. The USAID, the principal governing USAID is need-based assistance. If there's need, they try to meet those needs. The Millennium Challenge is more of a merit-based. So Armenia, uh, I think, will meet the merit-based tests. They had recently become a middle-income country, according to the World Bank. It, it may be that that this, this war and the, and, the, and the virus move Armenia back into the low-income category, at which point it would be eligible for a Millennium Challenge grant. Aram, since you mentioned recognition of Artsakh, I'll note another positive statement that my own congressman, Adam Schiff from California, made that the U.S. Congress should recognize Artsakh's independence, just like the French Parliament did back in October 2020. Given that only international states, in our case the federal executive branch, can officially recognize a country as a sovereign nation state, what's the value of these local, regional, city, county, or state-level recognitions, of which we now have dozens? If you study politics and certainly study movements, especially those that have seen progress over the course of years and decades, it's rarely ever. In fact, I'd be surprised if anyone could point to a single cause in which the progress has been secured in one bite. That just, it's just simply not the way politics works. It's usually incremental. It usually involves an escalation from civil society to universities to state level to congressional and then eventually executive branch. So that's generally been our approach on a whole range of issues. Recognition in one bite is the fact that that perfect outcome is not readily available to us does not mean that we should not push for the steps in that direction, things that contribute to that. So would you say that it's a bottoms up grassroots strategy rolling up to the executive level recognition? Our efforts in the area of arts off recognition certainly involve efforts with the federal government, but more fundamentally are part of an escalation strategy where we secure progress, where we can secure progress. And, and build on that and take it to the next level, the next level, the next level. That's the general approach. The fact that you know the perfect isn't available to us doesn't mean that we should not pursue the good. Can I just remind everybody that we just lost control over Artsakh? So uh, the Russians control Artsakh right now, or the, what's left of it, and the rest is controlled by Azerbaijan and uh, Turkish support. Uh, so we're entering the realm of uh, the genocide recognition, uh, sort of the next hundred years long-term project where Armenians will be striving to have Artsakh recognized while not controlling it. So we are entering an area where we're going to have a lot of hot air, just we had with the genocide recognition, without any uh, tangible outcome, just as we witnessed. Genocide has been recognized by a bunch of states, and uh, that's pretty much it. Artsakh might be recognized by a bunch of states, and that's pretty much it. This shifts things back into the realm of hypothetical rather than actual situation in Armenia. If a country were to decide to recognize Artsakh today, what borders would they recognize it in? Well, or is that that's, secondary? That's secondary. At this stage? The borders, yeah, the countries are never yeah. recognized. Uh, <laughs> only, <laughs> only in the case of Armenia, uh, you know, uh, they've uh, sort of defaulted to Google Maps or whatever. But uh, they're, you know, they're not going to use any kind of Google Maps. So it's essentially a recognition of its right to self-determination. Yes, yes, yes. Asped Kochigian, do you have any comments? I did some research about the incoming uh, Secretary of State and in policies and his stand. I think it's quite interesting in a sense that. Uh, regionally speaking, where would Armenia fall in larger context of new U.S. foreign policy? On the one hand, there is a continued in 
interest in pressuring Iran to come back to the negotiation or to respect the nuclear uh, agreement. Where would Armenia fall in that? And historically, uh, Blinken's records is basically, he's usually tough uh, when it comes focusing on Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iran to a lesser extent. I just want to think about us to think in general uh, within the context of that track record, I think, in terms of what would be for Armenia. Yeah, I wanted to add to your concerns, U.S.-Russia relations. For instance, oh, absolutely. Uh, one of I was the, going to mention that. Yeah. One of the, yeah, one of the staunch critics of Russia uh, and the uh, hawk on Russia, Victoria Newland, is the nominee for Undersecretary of uh, Undersecretary of Political Affairs, which number three, number three position. The U.S. has to reset, to borrow a term used by Secretary Clinton a couple of years ago, but the uh, United States will be resetting its relationship with a lot of countries, including uh, Russia and Turkey. Uh, just recently, Blinken himself actually had criticized Turkey. It's sort of oscillating between two. At some point, when there was a choice between Turkey and uh, Kurdish fighters in northern Syria, he expressed strong support of Turkey. That was, I think, in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. But then again, when there were talks about Cyprus reunification and so on, he was quite critical of, of Turkey. The reason why I'm focused on Blinken in this case is because I feel that unlike the situation before in the last four years, the the Department of the State is going to have quite an interesting and independent role to play, very much shaped by the incoming Secretary of State. I agree with that aspect. I think Blinken is going to be a strong Secretary of State as far as U.S. policy. However, in regard to Armenian issues specifically, I read the questions and answers between Menendez and Blinken that ANCA published. The uh, the sense that I got it's basically continuation of what policy was under uh, previous government, including humanitarian assistance that Pompeo already announced, and obviously Nano Seven comes under review on an annual basis. Basically, I didn't see any sign, at least public sign, from a new secretary-designee that there would be any kind of sanction against Azerbaijan, uh, be that through 907 or, more importantly, through financial sanctions or through uh, any kind of sanctions based on uh, the war crimes that have occurred. And, uh, unfortunately, I don't expect that to happen unless there is a much more considerable effort to achieve that. The ANC keeps a tab on American politicians and even assigns grades to their service from an Armenian-centric perspective. Aram, what is your impression of the incoming Biden administration, the history of the various personalities that we're going to be dealing with in the coming term, like Biden, Harris, Blinken, others? Broadly speaking, the, the Biden administration represents a return to some normalcy. It's just a more predictable environment. That's good and bad, right? So the, it's good in the sense that the negative swings won't be quite so bad. The promise, I guess, of the Trump administration, which was unrealized, was something like that he would be a disruptive force and that groups that typically, you know, aren't invested in the status quo, there would be a chance for some change. And that, that didn't work out in any meaningful way for us. I guess at this stage, given how the Trump administration worked out, it's not so bad to have a little bit of predictability. And that's going to come with all the pluses and minuses, right? You have all the establishment views on Russia and Iran and Caspian Energy and NATO and Syria and Israel and all that. You're back into the world of a more predictable take on Armenian issues with a lot of continuity. At the level of the president, policy changed and every president has their signature issues, whether it's Iran or Cuba or whatever. But then if you go far enough down the issue chain, uh, that stuff gets staffed out by career people. And very often it's on those issues that there's a lot of continuity. Let's see how high the Armenian issue will go. Yeah. You know, does it get to the, the desk of Blinken and Biden, Harris? Or does it get staffed out? The likely answer is that a few times in the next four years, it'll get onto their desk, and the rest of the time, it'll get managed at the staff level. What about the new Congress and the new Senate? I think that the new Senate is uh, going to be a bit more supportive because now the key chairmanships are being held and the leadership is being held by people who are generally friendly on Armenian issues, from, from Chuck Schumer to uh, Menendez and Senator Reid of Rhode Island and, and Leahy of uh, Vermont. And others. Uh, so that that's a good move. The fact that the House is so narrowly divided also creates opportunity. There are now several house districts that are swing districts with considerable Armenian populations, and um, that also gives us some opportunity. Aram, one of the things that you mentioned, and we're all hoping for some sense of normalcy in terms of U.S. administration and so on, but do you think that there might be a reaction uh, to the last four years to have too much of a normalcy? Um, I guess. I mean, that's, that's always a risk. I guess we interact in, in a very broad sense, Armenians writ large interact with America, Washington at, at, at three different levels. One is the geopolitical level, and then we face all the challenges of Russia and Iran and all that. 
And then the second is the civilizational level of democracy, Christianity, values, things of that sort. And the third is like the electoral or political or constituency uh, engagement. I think the geopolitical doesn't change that much. The civilizational will shift a little bit because you have a little bit less of a, a Christian focus, let's say, or America first focus or whatever you want to call it, the Trump thing. Uh, well, that'll transition to something that's a little more typical in American political life. And I guess the third area, which is the area we can control the most, which is our electoral or political or constituency activism, I think that's that's where we have to make our change. I think placing our hopes on new geopolitical thinking in Washington is probably not the best approach. You know, pushing the, the civilization issues, that should always be done. We should be building bridges and forming co connections and coalitions all the time. But I think the game that we have to increase is our advocacy game, right? Like getting more people out of the stands, out of the press box, and more of them onto the field, you know, moving the ball down the field. That's, I think, our goal. And I think that's always been our challenge as a community, which is we've had a great, like, no shortage of thinkers. My God, we have some of the brightest minds anywhere. The trick is how do we get those people from the understanding and speaking role into the activism role? I think I would say that the approach of uh, Armenian-American activism uh, over the past number of years has to change, because if we look at any successful outcomes when it comes to uh, U.S. policy relevant to a fairly narrow uh, group of uh, interested individuals. You know, we're talking about a small community. These things are not achieved by a mere grassroots activity. You know, there has to be investment into the actual decision-making process in, in Washington, which, uh, you know, involves former officials, future officials, current officials. And uh, the position that the Armenian-American community often had taken was that we have a moral reason to demand something from this government and uh, they should deliver because that's morally correct or because that's that respects uh, the position of segment of the Armenian community. But, you know, th there are so many communities in this country and now at this point I think Turkish community is as large as uh, the Armenian community. Uh, and to be able to expect just because there's a community that there's going to be, uh, their voice is going to be heard through grassroots activity or whatnot, I don't think that has been proven uh, or will be proven. Emil, these are really important thoughts about strategy and efficacy of Armenian advocacy in Washington and maybe around the world. I'm going to add them to my conversations on groom topics to come back to with the stakeholders around the table. This is a crucial topic to explore more deeply. For the present, Aram, can you give us an idea of what the coming three to four years hold as far as Armenian-American priorities go, essentially during the upcoming Biden-Harris term? Sure. I think uh, support for Armenia in the form of humanitarian and development assistance, number one. Number two, steps to deter Turkey and Azerbaijan to the extent that we can do that in the form of cutting off military aid, enforcing Section 907, uh, potentially imposing sanctions. And then third, some level of re-engagement in the international process on status and securities regarding Artsakh uh, through the Minsk Group and other, other, other arenas. Thanks, Aram. I know we're doing this in the context of our Weekend Review show on the weekend following Biden's inauguration, and we can dedicate a full conversation podcast on this issue alone. So we may have you back soon to focus on it in greater depth. All right, that is a good place to stop for today. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. That concludes our program for this Week in Review episode. We hope it has helped your understanding of some of the issues from the previous week. We look forward to your feedback and your suggestions for issues to cover in greater depth. Contact us on our website at grung.org or on our Facebook page, ann-grung, or in our Facebook group, Groom-Armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, like our pages, and follow us on social media. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.